I'd like to share some of my uh, sort of personal fascinations with you because I'm always very much intrigued when I look at things around me by why do things work? And what you see on the screen, you probably recognize it, right? The, the London tube map, which is an iconic image and it beca became so well known because it does an excellent job of simplifying the transport network. And you could say that it's almost a little bit too good at its job. Why is that? Well, when people are traveling in central London, and especially when they're not, um, not too familiar, they, they walk around with, uh, with the little map in their hands, and let's say they want to travel from Oxford Circus to Bond Street. So they look at the map and they're like, Oxford Circus, Bond Street, that's one stop on the red line, on the central line. What the map hides from them is that these stations are only a couple of hundred meters apart. It's far quicker, especially in rush hour, to just walk. Instead of going down to the platform, waiting for a train, you might have to skip one or two um, when, it's, when it's really busy, go up again. It's far quicker to walk, but the map is too good at simplifying the transport network and essentially hides this information from you. And that's why you see these signs popping up everywhere in London now, on the street level. There are little maps, little plans of your immediate surroundings. And what they show are circles that depict how far a 5, a 10, or a 15 minute walk would be. So that people can also uh, consider alternative ways of getting to their, to their destinations. So I like these kinds of things, something that, that works works really well, or you could say almost too well, and that's, that's one end of the spectrum. And on the other end, we have stuff that does not work at all, where we need explanatory signs for something as basic as a light switch, where we need signs that says this is on, this is off, and this button corresponds to this part of the room. Irony, by the way, the one on the, uh, on the left, uh, I snapped that at the Delft University Faculty of Industrial Engineering. So they might have a bit of homework uh, to do there uh, themselves. So that's well and good, but what on earth does all this have to do with security? Uh, it's nice that I'm intrigued by these things, but um, what, what can we learn from that in our, uh, in our discipline? Um, my background is in, is in incident response and in uh, digital forensics, so I've always seen stuff going wrong, and it's from observing things going wrong that I became fascinated by, by these kinds of things, by looking for these kinds of examples in our field as well. Why do things work and why do they don't work in our field, and especially in the intersection between technology and, and people, because that's often where things are, uh, are, are going wrong. So I'm starting to look for those, these kinds of things in our, in our industry. And I think in general we are in a bit of a strange industry to, to start with. Um, because on one hand we all say, assume you will be breached and don't ask if you will be breached, ask when. And assume compromise. Yet when there is a compromise and when a company does have to report about a breach, we're the first ones to all lean back while our, our competitors or our friends in the, our fellow security teams are working their asses off to, to try and resolve the matter. We are all behind our keyboards commenting on um, what are all the mistakes they're making. And, and it's almost a security equivalent of, yeah, well, she was wearing a, a skirt that was a little bit too short. They, they had it coming uh, for themselves. So all of a sudden we forget the assume breach and you will all go through an incident. And we have a similar, I could should say, ambivalent approach to vendors. I mean, who likes vendors? Who likes their products? We all pretend or say we don't, and we think their, their products are crap and they don't work at all. And then we get back to their desks, and we buy more of their products, because somebody is buying this stuff, and it must be people who are at the bar saying that, that they don't believe a thing the vendors are saying. And then there's people, there's users. Users are the, humans are the weakest link. Or we need 
patch for human stupidity. You can even get t-shirts of this stuff. Can you believe it? It's a bit pedantic if you ask me. This, this notion that we're, that we're sharing, that claiming that we have created this environment that's safe, that's reliable, and only we have these idiots making a mess of everything. We have a couple of bad apples in the bowl that are, running it, that are ruining it for, for everybody. It's, it's, it's pedantic, but if you ask me, it's also a plain wrong statement to make. Nobody comes to work with the intention of making a mess of things. It might look like that in hindsight, but nobody comes to work with that intention, with maybe one exception, but I'm not sure if that qualifies as, as a person. Um, for those of you that are familiar with Netflix's Chaos Monkey, yeah, that is the one person that has making a mess of things in his job description. But let's forget about the Chaos Monkey uh, for, uh, for a bit here. Now, if you look into research that, that dives into, into human error, um, such research, research puts the ball back into the court of complex environments. So what, and what does that mean? It means that if you conclude that an incident is the result of human error, you have not explored that incident deep enough. You need to you need to start, um, um, you need to, to, to start digging, digging deeper because human error is a symptom at best. It, it, it's not a cause. You need to look for a systemic unclarity. There might be competing incentives. There might be some other systemic reason earlier on in the process that results in something going, on, going, going wrong. So, in other words, if you conclude a who being responsible, start digging deeper and find the underlying what. And in our field, I think with that in mind, we need to, to shift our thinking. We need to become more focused on what the people in our organizations are trying to do in their daily work and try to see if we can build security around that rather than steering them away from, from doing bad things. And I always really like the analogy you see on the screen of desire trails or olifantenpaadjes for those of you that speak Dutch. Um, what are desire trails? They are, um, you see what you see on the screen, um, you see the, the, the bus stop in, uh, in, in, the, um, in, in the middle of the screen, and of course the council and the planning intended for people to just walk nicely on the sidewalk when they were going to the bus stop. But people being people, being smart and, and going for the logical fastest route, of course at some point start walking straight across the grass. And one person starts, a second follows, and a couple of more do it, and you start seeing these little trails form, them, form themselves on the grass. I think that is, that is security in a nutshell when it comes to how we're trying to, to influence human behavior. Because what do we do? We keep putting up signs, we're like, uh -uh, don't walk on the grass. And people still do it, of course, because it's the logical thing to do. So we put up a little fence, and people step over it. We make it higher, we add a guard dog, we add CCTV, you name it. But we fail to take a step back and understand, wait a second, what were these people trying to do in the first place? And is there a way we can, uh, we, we can help them do that in a secure, secure way? And what we're doing in all this, we're steering people away from, from what we don't want them to do. We, um, and, and, and with all doing that, with us saying no all the time, we, we don't just try to steer them away, we lose their involvement, we lose their sympathy as well. Um, remember, nobody comes to work with the intention of making a mess of things. People understand security is important these days. They read the paper as well. But it's just that we make it so hard for them to do the right, the right things. And we keep wondering with all this, with this behavior, with us saying no, why we don't get involved as a department early on, right? Think, think back of your own organizations. We always get approached only with a binary question. That's how far we've, 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 we've let, it, let it slip. Um, they only come to us, our colleagues, with a question along the lines of, can I put my data in the cloud, yes or no? Or can I use USB sticks, yes or no? It's hardly ever that 
we are perceived as a team that you can go to and that, that where you can come with a net question along the lines of, I'm trying to get something done, I'm trying to innovate, I'm trying to create something new. Can you work with me? Can you help me to do it in a secure way? Because what do we do? We keep building our infosec Jenga towers of layers and layers and layers of complexity and tools and procedures and we hardly ever take something away. It's, we, we just, we have our 15 year old dogmas that nobody ever is asking anymore, is this still applicable? Does this still work? Does this still solve now today's problems? No, we just keep adding more and more and more stuff to it without ever taking something away. And with every intended layer of defense, we essentially create a layer of excuse. Ah, oh, I don't have to check this as thoroughly as I probably should because well, there's a second layer of defense to pick it up or we always have internal audits to if it's really serious. Um, don't do today what you can push off onto someone else's plate. So how do we patch this? How do we patch our own ignorance or maybe even our own arrogance? One thing, um, I think we underuse our checklists and that's a, of course a, a weird word to say to security people because with a checklist we always think of compliance and auditors um, where all the boxes are ticked but nothing has changed or nothing is really secure. That's not what I mean obviously, I mean real proper checklists like pilots use. Um, so a, a good well designed checklist helps a human operator to essentially offload some of their mental capacity to the checklist. Make sure you don't forget any of the routine stuff so you can free your mind to be creative, respond to changing situations and do things that humans are good at. So that's a great and, and I would say proven, proven concept but it doesn't really scale that well. Um, we, we can probably use this for, for us, the, you could say the pilots in security, the people who are uh, uh, who are the, uh, the admins of the networks, who are uh, creating applications. For us, this might be a tool that we should use more to make sure we, we don't overlook obvious things and we can focus on the, the cool and the creative stuff. But the second patch that I'd like to, to introduce and elaborate a bit more on is to focus more on people and to try and look at concepts like design thinking or human-centered design in general. So what's design thinking? Design thinking is a methodology that was created by IDEO, uh, a design consultancy uh, in uh, the United States. And the, if, if, if you try to depict it in, in, one, uh, in, in one diagram, it's these five faces that you, that you see on the screen. And the important one to start with is that your, your base assumption or your, your ground position should start with a strong empathy with users, with people. So you're not going at your problem with what's the technical problem that I'm trying to solve. No, you're taking a step back and you're saying what, are, what is a person or what's a group of people trying to do and in order to, to achieve their task, what might help them, what might hinder them. And from that, fr from that ground position, you're going through um, the, the next phases to define the problem and try to come up with potential different solutions. And note, I say potential different solutions because we also should not just again take out our 15-year-old good practice and assume it will be a one-size-fits-all solution to every problem. Now, don't pretend you already have the answer. Um, come up with one or a couple of different other solutions and build a simple prototype to try and test if it works first before you start rolling it out to everybody. And it's important to realize, to, to do these things right, to, to start with this empathy and to, to be able to thoroughly test these prototypes, we need to get out there, right? We have to get away from our desks, we need to, have to get away from our laptops, we need to speak to real people to try and understand how they are doing their day jobs so that we can try to build our solutions, solutions around that. Let me illustrate the empathy part with what I think is a, is a beautiful example. 2G Tuesdays. What are 2G Tuesdays? 2G Tuesdays are a concept that Facebook introduced in their, uh, in their offices. Because 
as I assume everybody knows, Facebook, of course, growing rapidly, and uh, a lot of their growth nowadays is in emerging economies, countries where network speeds might not be as fast as what we're used to in, in Europe or in, uh, in the States. And what they realized, if you are an engineer in, in Silicon Valley at your, uh, at your, your speedy uh, broadband connection, you don't really realize what it is to be in, let's say, Delhi and use the Facebook mobile app on a slow 2G connection. So Facebook took an approach where on Tuesdays, everybody in the office now gets a prompt whenever they log on to the network, try to make a connection. Do you want 2G speed? Yes or no? And of course, you can still say no if you want to get stuff done uh, and you need, you need faster network. But you can also say, yeah, go ahead. Let's throttle my network speed and let me literally experience what it's like to be in uh, a country or a region where network speeds are slow. And they've, they've come to the conclusion that this really helps in, in making sure that their application and their site are, um, are, are better designed for people who are using it on a slow network connection. So I think a great example of almost literally um, putting yourself in the position of uh, the people you are, you are working for. It's important to stress as well because I've mentioned the word design here, that design is not just about how something looks, it's not just about an, uh, an interface or how something, uh, the physical shape of, of, a, uh, of an object, it's also especially something that, that is important when it comes to interactions and, and especially interactions between you could say the real and the digital world, it's people need in, in, in general, in these kinds of interactions, they need help making sense of them, and they need those interactions to be simple and intuitive and pleasurable. And in our field, in security, I don't think a lot has improved in those three elements since this paper came out in 1999. I mean, Johnny is probably still sending his private key to, uh, to recipients, and let's be honest, the only major breakthrough in the use of encryption has been the deployment uh, of end-to-end -end encryption by WhatsApp. And while we're still mumbling a little bit on the side and, and talking about, yeah, but what about key management and key exchange, one billion people are using it. So that might be an example of where we should also realize that done is better than perfect and a maybe less than ideal solution that is widely adopted and that is widely used might be preferable than the technically perfect one that nobody understands and that a couple of thousand people are only using. But back to interactions, is every interaction with security in general, with our teams, um, with our policies, with our tools, it gives us a potential, a, a, a potential opportunity to impress. And Think back to, think to your own organizations, right? Think about how you set up your teams, how you communicate with your colleagues or your customers, how you, your tools are deployed, how you word error messages, and think about all those interactions that your colleagues have with you as security organization. And are those interactions indeed simple and intuitive and pleasurable? Are there any examples where security might even manage to put a smile on any of our colleagues' faces? Do we still agree we need a patch for human stupidity? Let me dive into an example here. Phishing. I think in, in general fairly well understood concept, right? And, and most organizations are now in the position where they're like, oh, yeah, we, we want our employees to be our human sensor network. So we send them on a phishing awareness training so we can tick off a box and please an auditor. Um, and that's where we stop. We don't think these things through from a sort of end-to-end -end perspective. What if one of, these, one of our colleagues actually has really paid attention in the training and recognizes this as a potential phishing email? What do you do? How do you report this? Where do you report it? What's the kind of information you should send? Do you get any feedback on whether or not you, you did the right thing? Um, can the receiving end do anything with it? Can they maybe purge the, the email from other receivers' mailboxes, or can they only register this for statistical... Uh, 
is there a quicker or more satisfying way we can, we can think of for people to, to report this, where they don't just get an angry phone call from the help desk because they forgot to include header information or they're, they're not made fun of by the security team because they were among the 10% the who didn't spot the phishing awareness training. And this is even really the problem we're trying to solve. We spent probably over 20 years teaching people how to click on links. My dad still double clicks on them, but in general, most people by now realize, okay, if it's underlined or different color, you can click on it and something happens. And now we're trying to undo this again. And we're trying to say, well, yeah, that link thing we, we spoke about, yeah, not all links are alike. There's a couple of things to check, and maybe you shouldn't click on all of them. I think it's an, an example of where we, we as security people don't really manage to get our act together. We don't really manage to, to solve this problem. And then we, yeah, maybe we even sort of give up and we say, well, yeah, for now it's in the hand of the users. You, you take this further, you pay it a little bit of attention right now, um, it's in your hands now. And I think another example of that is us continuously preaching against password reuse. Of course, there's logical reasons. If you use your, the same password at, at one side, it, it gets breached. Yeah, of course, somebody could reuse it to, to target another site or another application or what have you where you have reused that same password. Sure, that, that's a logical reason behind that. But taking a couple of steps back, whose responsibility was it in the first place to make sure that that original website's passwords were properly protected, properly encrypted, that there, were, that there was good detection in place when something was going wrong. I think that's again an example where we as an industry don't really get to solve the problem and we then we're just offloading part of that problem to our users again. Yeah, you just create uh, 150 different passwords because we can't really protect them that well. To make matters worse when it comes to phishing, organizations, and especially large ones, they send out dozens and dozens of legitimate emails that look exactly like phishing emails. And especially employee awareness or, or satisfaction surveys are notorious for this. They come from an external provider, so an external email address. You have to go to an external website. You have to fill out all sorts of quite sensitive information on whether or not you're happy with your job and whether or not you like your manager. But it's not phishing, it's legitimate. And the only thing we, we manage to communicate about this is by sending more emails to people who are already receiving dozens and dozens or hundreds and hundreds of emails a day. And the irony in all this, I think criminals do this a lot better. You, you get better customer service if you are the victim of a ransomware infection than when you're trying to, to deal with phishing and are trying to deal with the average help desk in whichever organization. So I think there's definitely still a way to, uh, to go here. Remember the PCP paper um, a couple of slides back, right? That was 1999, and this is 2016 now, and this is how Microsoft Office is trying to protect me when I receive an attachment via email. I want to, let's say, a word attachment, and I want to print it. So I hit Ctrl-P or I click the print icon and I'm in protected view now. So apparently printing is still a dangerous activity. Um, I'm in protected view. To get out of it and print, I can click Enable Printing. And that's it. There's not an awful lot of information on yeah, what might be the risks. Is there, is there an alternative? Um, what happens if, uh, if I don't want to do this? I wanted to print the bloody document in the first place, so what on earth do you think I'm going to do? Of course I'm going to click Enable Printing. And have we made my laptop more secure, or have we made printing one click harder? If you ask me, it's the latter. And I, I want to see more of these kinds of examples, like you see on the screen, where IKEA, of all organizations, does what I think is a really nice job of, it, it, it's, it's silly and, and simple, of course, but just with something as simple as a sticker on the floor showing, yeah, you can get this, 
um, y y you can get this, this, this closet with sliding doors or with a normal door. But hey, with a normal door, you need this much space in your bedroom because, because it's open. And of course, it's, it's silly, it's simple, but I'd love to see more of these kinds of examples instead of, yeah, you're in protected view and yeah, there's actually not that much more we can tell you, just deal with it and click enable printing. I'd like to highlight some uh, examples and, and maybe solutions or at least directions of solutions from, from other industries that I think we, we can learn uh, from when we try to influence people's behavior. And first one is the concept of A-B testing, which yeah, has, in, in, in this phrase has become very well known because it's, it's a technique very, uh, very often used in, in online marketing and, uh, environments and teams. But actually, of course, it is the foundation of science as well. It is, you take one version of a website, a tool, what have you, put, put it out to, let's say, half of your test population, a different version to the other half, and you measure which one gives the best effect, whether it's more sales, uh, less churn when it comes to, to uh, uh, an e-commerce website. But of course, there might be other effects that you want to measure uh, as well. And to illustrate, what you see on the screen are two uh, icons that Facebook tested when they were developing a new app for iOS. So you see the, the, the icon with the squares were a new, a new one they design, designed themselves. Um, the one on the right, of course, is the standard iOS spinning icon. And they applied A-B testing here. So half of their test group got the, the squares, the other half got the iOS spinning icon. And people reported really different perceptions of waiting times um, in, uh, in, in their test groups. Because the people who, had the, um, who, who saw the, the squares, the new icon, they associated that icon with Facebook, with the app, with the website. So they reported. Yeah, Facebook was a little bit slow with this new app. People on the right, with the Apple spinning icon, they associated the waiting times with their phones because they associated it with iOS. So they were like, yeah, well, the new app, it's all right, but my phone was a little bit slow. Of course, the waiting times were exactly the same, right? Um, but a completely different perception. And yeah, of course, Facebook did go uh, at that version for the, the iOS spinning icon to make sure that every delays or every slowness would not be blamed on them, but on, uh, on, on Apple. Um, but I think it's a, it's, it's a powerful example of why or, or how A-B testing could work. And again, this is not, or this is something that we can apply also to, not just to, to an interface like in the example, but also to something like how we, we word a policy or how we word some sort of document. Um, Again, don't assume that what we've been doing for 10 or 15 years still works, but put out a couple of different versions and ask feedback and see which one people understand best and go for that, uh, for that approach. Another, what I think, underused effect is the, um, the default effect. What you see? On the screen is the uh, percentages of, of the population in different countries that are registered as, as organ donors. And the countries with the bars in green, where you have percentages close to 100% of people registered as organ donors, um, they have an opt-out system. Everybody is a donor except in situations where you explicitly write or tell the government you don't want to be an organ donor. Once on the left, where they, the percentages are below 20 or below 30 percent, they have an, um, have an opt-in system. Nobody is a donor except when you explicitly tell the government you want to be an organ donor. And these differences are, um, are, are, are explained from, from this difference between opt-in versus opt-out. People are inclined to stick to, towards the, to the default option that is presented to them. If you present people with a, a pre-selected choice, they're not that inclined to change to the other version. So this is something that we can utilize as well whenever we try to present people with different options and there's one option that we sort of want them to take, um, make sure that it's selected as the default one. And 
I think a good, a good example that is used more and more now in our field is um, the mechanism for deploying updates to, uh, to, to OSs or to, uh, to applications like Google Chrome or iOS are doing. Um, of course, in the old days, you had to go to uh, about, check for updates, and then you could manually uh, get, get updates uh, for your application. Nowadays, this is all done by default unless you explicitly um, block these, uh, uh, block the uh, deployment of new versions of the tool. And we can amplify this, this effect, this default effect more by showing people what other people have done. Because we are, in, in the end, we're all, you could say, sort of herd animals, and we are receptive to what people like us have done. So that's why, again, Market marketeers understand this this like no other. That, that's why you see these kinds of screens on, on websites everywhere. Um, this is our most popular plan, or people like you generally choose this. And you see that subconsciously people, they are indeed attr attracted to the option that people like them um, yeah, have chosen, chosen before. So that could be another way where we try to think of how we word our communication and say, yeah, most people in your team or in your part of the business, they have already done this, or they have already created a long passphrase, or they have already done this. Um, try to see if there's these kinds of, could say, almost subconscious clues where we can, can steer people towards what we, what we want them to do. And we should look in general, and that's back to, of course, the, the empathy and understanding how people are doing their, their normal jobs, to understanding people's incentives, what's in it for them, and trying to see if we can somehow make sure that security is a little bit more aligned with those. And of course, this, this might, be, might be hard to search for these kinds of examples, but it, it can be along the, along the lines of, like the example on the screen, if you do the right thing, if you choose a secure password or if you use two-factor authentication, well, we'll reward you with um, some extra storage if we're Dropbox. Or if you do ch create that long passphrase of more than 20 characters, we're not going to bother you to change your password every three months because, yeah, we, are, we see that you're doing the right thing. You, you won't hear from us for another year or maybe even never. And we should also understand incentives or or at least keep our eyes open for incentives in a more sort of macro systemic uh, systemic way because in some cases our problems might not be only technical in nature um, as an example the the variance in in different versions of android versus ios that are out there you, you see of course ios more people tend to be on the latest version there's there's far less dispersion in, in different versions that are out there, whereas in Android, a lot of people are still on very old and therefore vulnerable versions of the operating system. That's not, that's not a technical problem, right? I mean, Google puts out the updates, uh, and it's not like Android is, is better or worse than iOS in, in, in that sense, but it, it's also caused by the incentives of the, the telcos and the phone manufacturers. In the Android situation, the, the, the manufacturers of the handsets or the telcos, as soon as they sold you the phone or they sold you the subscription, their work is done. They made the money and they have no financial incentive to do any aftercare. So to, in this case, customize a new version of Android and put it out to, to their customers. And in the case of iOS, on the other hand, um, Apple, of course, is, is far more financially incentivized in keeping iOS as a whole ecosystem trustworthy and secure. So they go through, through much more length in, um, in, in making it easy for people to update, keeping tighter control of different versions that are out there, and with, with the result of far, um, uh, far more people being on the latest version of the operating system out there. And of course, different approach, you can, there's, there's, there's pros and cons in, in different ones, but I think it's good to illustrate that in a lot of these situations, there, there might be, you could say, bigger factors at play. There, there's, that, that in these situations, it's just money that, yeah, that, that decides in a lot of these situations how organizations are acting and um, the, why we are, are fighting our battles. And I think the recent uh, uproar on the, uh, the DIN DNS hack and the, the IoT devices is 
probably another example where we see these, these kinds of problems uh, arising. What are the financial incentives for these webcam and other s supposedly smart devices uh, that are out there? Um, and is there a way we can make sure that there are financial incentives to, to reward organizations and vendors to do the right thing, do the secure thing? And finally, language, words. We, IT in general, but security probably even more, we, we use incredible amount of jargon. And a lot of our jargon is of, comes from, from, from the military. We have our uh, cyber kill chain, and we have our adversaries and threats, and we go hunting. And it makes us sound like we're some sort of James, wannabe James Bonds behind our behind our keyboards and yeah, yeah, yet we, we keep wondering why the business doesn't take us seriously. It's speak, we're not the only team that's against, that's working against a persistent and skillful and adaptive group of people who are in it for the money, right? Speak to, if, if you have sales team in your organization, speak to them, their competitor sales team teams are doing exactly the same, but they are not referring to them as uh, a advanced, ever adapting adversary. They're just calling it what it is. It's the competition's sales team. So remember, simple and intuitive, and keep that in mind as well when we, uh, when we put out our communication and our, uh, and our wording. And I think a great example is the um, application that you see on the screen, which was put out by the uh, design uh, agency that created uh, the, the signage at uh, Amsterdam Schiphol Airport and a couple of other airports around the world. Um, what they do in this app, they give, they give uh, examples of their considerations when they are helping people make sense of a, a stressful situation, a travel situation. You are an unfamiliar location, you probably press for time, and with their signs and the way these are designed and the wording, they help people be at least a little bit calmer. And I think there are a lot of nice pointers there in how they choose the wording, how they uh, use color, uh, uh, lots of very practical things that we can, can look at and can try to, to adapt when we help our, our customers or our colleagues make sense of our world. And, um, yeah, I think that's another area where we should definitely look at other disciplines to, to become better as an industry. So closing off, we've um, looked at design thinking, human-centered design uh, as, uh, as a concept. We've uh, looked at a couple of other examples from other disciplines that I think we can, um, we can apply in our, uh, in our field. What I would like for you all to, to, when you walk out of here and, and, and go on, and especially when you go back to, to your jobs or to, to your studies, is to at least walk out of here with your minds a little bit more open towards these, these kinds of challenges and a little bit more, maybe a little bit more receptive for um, what makes things work and what do makes them not work. And I think a couple of things we should stop doing, we should um, do better and maybe even start doing. And, what to stop doing, it's really the old, the slow stuff, the supposedly good practices. Um, we, we have to be very critical on, on these things. Does it work? Does it still solve our problem? If it doesn't work, don't pile something new on top of it. Just take it away. It saves up, it, it saves up time and money. It, it removes complexity, um, and it makes our organizations eventually better. Um, what we should do better is to be more inclusive and less judging towards people. No more humans are the weakest link, no more attribution to, to human error. Um, but yeah, be, be a friendlier team, be a friendlier security team so that we can really work together with our colleagues and um, indeed be perceived as the team that you actually want to go to when you, when you need help. And with all that, what we hopefully can start doing is build security that is so seamless and so simple that it becomes almost invisible, that you just cannot imagine it not being there. It, it's just there, it just, it just works. And that might be tools, it might be uh, how, we, how we set up, uh, set up our policies, but it might even be how we, how we design our teams, how we set up our teams. Maybe the security team eventually 
will also become invisible. No more separate police force, no more separate department of no, but just smart, supportive, sharing people who know a lot about security, but who are not in a separate team anymore, but who are really everywhere in the business, everywhere in our, in our organizations. And with that, I can only hope that we can build more um, security equivalents of the London tube maps, stuff that works amazingly well, instead of those crappy light switches or unusable software like PGP. Um, I think, yeah, that would, if we manage to do that, we are really, really helping our organizations move, uh, move forward. So with that, I'd urge you to, to all, as you go out, please take off your technical hats, take off your security hats, speak to your colleagues, speak to your customers, and try to walk a mile in their shoes. Thank you very much. <laughs>